Well, good morning, uh, or good afternoon, and uh, thank you. I'm Dan Tani. I uh, have a new, actually, responsibility at Northrop. I'm the program manager for the Commercial Destination Free Flyer Program, the Commercial Space Station Program. It's a uh, really uh, wonderful position to uh, think about what commercial space is going to be like in the future. And, uh, and uh, as, as was mentioned, I'm a former astronaut. I got to fly uh, in space on Expedition 16, primarily, a uh, long time ago. And uh, like, actually, when I, usually when I come to these things, I'm the astronaut, but now I think I'm like the 35th astronaut <laughs> up here on the stage. But, uh, but like many space flyers, uh, we come back having been, uh, having the privilege of seeing the Earth and, uh, in my case, feeling a real uh, possession of, of our home planet and a real protection of our home planet. And, uh, and so uh, I, that still lives with me today that uh, we live on a beautiful place and we need to take care of it. Uh, I come with some good news uh, this morning uh, that on Monday, this past Monday, the high in Phoenix was 108 degrees. Yeah, so which broke the 31 day continuous record of over 110 degrees uh, in, in Phoenix. Uh, we've all seen the headlines of the uh, weather around the world, the, the uh, forest fires, the incredible temperatures, uh, and uh, something's happening out there, and it's, uh, it's really uh, eye-opening. My daughter at dinner the other day said, was reading uh, the news, and she said there's a new phenomena that they're worried about in Phoenix, and that's that the hospitals uh, are not only are dealing, with, well, one of the things that they're dealing with now is people are falling down and getting second degree burns because of just contact with the pavement or the sidewalk. Uh, it's really, really troubling. Um, now, I'm, I understand that weather is not climate, <clears throat> but I'm probably like most of us who thinks we know something about climate because we experience uh, weather. And, uh, but I think, uh, like hopefully all of us, we're smart enough to know that we really don't understand climate. It's very complicated. And so we're very, very fortunate to have incredibly smart people uh, in our lives and in the world that uh, know how to study climate, know uh, or know the right questions to ask, the research to do, to figure out the cause of, uh, of everything that's happening to us here. And so that's why I'm so pleased to uh, be introducing uh, Dr. Calvin this morning. Uh, Dr. Calvin is currently uh, the chief scientist and also the administrator's senior climate advisor, uh, two very important roles uh, at NASA. Uh, formerly, she's been doing that for a couple years, formerly she was uh, with the Joint Global Change Research Institute, uh, which is part of the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory, oddly in Maryland, so I don't know how it got named the Pacific Northwest National Lab. <coughs> um, she, there, she worked on the Global Change Analysis Model, which is a system for exploring and analyzing the relationship between human and Earth systems in the context of global uh, climate change. Uh, obviously, uh, an extremely important uh, topic uh, that needs to get understood. Uh, she also worked on the DOE's uh, uh, ex exascale, is that right? Exascale Earth System Model. Um, and her research simulated the interaction between global resources, focusing on the impact of land, water, and energy use through environmental and a social, uh, socioeconomic lens. Um, she's also uh, worked with the National Academy of Sciences and the U.S. Energy Information Administration. So quite honestly, I feel like uh, that we're all on the Titanic, and I'm getting to introduce an expert in how steel interfaces with ice at a high rate of uh, velocity. Um, I think we're really honored uh, to have her uh, and, uh, and hear from her today. So please help me in welcoming Dr. Kate Calvin to the stage.
Thank you, Dan, and thank you for having me here. I'm really excited to talk to you today about how we observe climate change from space. I'm also happy to be here in the Pacific Northwest. As Dan mentioned, I worked for the Pacific Northwest National Lab, but in Maryland, so I didn't have too many opportunities to come out here, and so I'm excited to be here. Um, I want to start with talking a little bit about why. Um, so why we do this at NASA. So one of our most important missions at NASA is our home planet, and this goes back more than 50 years. And so I'm sure most people in this room are familiar with this picture. Um, this is Earthrise, taken from Apollo 8 in 1968 by an astronaut named Bill Anders. And I had the opportunity to interview Bill Anders earlier this year um, and hear the story behind this photo. So they were the first crewed mission to explore the moon, and as they're orbiting around the moon, they saw this and took this picture. And as what astronaut Bill Anders said, we came all this way to explore the moon, and the most important thing is that we discovered the Earth. And at NASA, we've been looking back at Earth ever since. So why climate? This is an animation of temperature anomalies, so changes in temperature from a baseline. The animation starts in the late 1800s, and it'll work its way through today um, to 2022. Um, this is using surface temperature, so weather stations on the ground, but if you were to look at satellite observations of temperature, you'll see similar trends over the same time period. But what we see are that temperatures are rising. 2022 was tied for the fifth warmest on record, and collectively the last nine years have been the warmest since modern record keeping began. If you've read the news lately, you're hearing about extreme heat um, and, and temperatures around the world. Um, NASA confirmed that June was the hottest June on record this year, um, and we are um, seeing these temperature records being broken because of climate change. Climate change isn't just changes in temperature. So we are seeing, you know, about two degrees Fahrenheit of warming since the late 19th century. We see more warming over land than over ocean, more in high latitudes than low latitudes. But it's more than just temperatures that are rising with climate change. We see other impacts. We're seeing declines in Arctic sea ice. We see changes in the mass of ice sheets, and those ice sheets, when they melt, run into the ocean and lead to sea level rise. Uh, we are seeing changes in the water cycle, so we see more heavy precipitation events, and in some regions, more droughts. We also see more extreme events, like heat waves and wildfires. And a lot of these we've seen right here in the U.S. in the last several months. So we're seeing heat waves like those mentioned in Phoenix. We're seeing flooding in the Northeast. And we even had wildfire smoke coming into the Northeast this year from a fire burning in Canada. Um, and so what we know is that a lot of these impacts are li um, linked to climate change, and as it gets warmer, we would expect to see more. So with every increment of warming, we see more climate and extremes, um, more changes in climate, more impacts, and more extremes, and they become more widespread and pronounced. This is an image, uh, a figure from the re most recent Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report, um, and it's to illustrate how impacts scale with temperature. So we've experienced about 2 degrees Fahrenheit warming now, which is about 1.1 degrees Celsius. This is showing just one example of what happens as it gets warmer. So it's showing you what would happen in the world at 1.5 degrees Celsius, which is about 2.7 Fahrenheit, at 2 degrees Celsius, 3 and 4 degrees Celsius. And what you see, this particular example, is the hottest day temperature change. So how much more warmer the hottest day of the year gets. And as global temperatures rise, we'll see more of these extremes. For some impacts, they become more intense, some become more frequent, and some both. But how much more warming we experience depends on act, um, actions taken between now and the future, and I will come back to that. But first, I want to talk about how NASA studies the Earth. So one of our primary ways of studying the planet is through our Earth-observing fleet. We have more than two dozen satellites and instruments in orbit, including several on the International Space Station. They can show us things like vegetation, clouds and precipitation, carbon dioxide, changes in the mass of ice sheets, and much more. And we've been observing the Earth for decades, so we can see both what it looks like today, but also how it's changed over time. Um, so I just want to give a few examples of that. One I'll talk about is called Landsat, and in this animation you'll see two instances of Landsat, Landsat 8 and Landsat 9. So Landsat is a satellite that observes uh, land use and land cover. So it can see where there are trees, where there are crops, where there's snow, urban areas, lakes. 
Um, and the first Landsat was in 1972, and we've continuously been monitoring this since. So we have more than 50 years of land use and land cover information. And so when you look through that record, you can see things like urbanization, so our cities are getting bigger. You can see declines in forest cover in some parts of the world. You can see changes in the size of lakes, uh, both you know, within a few years as well as over time. And the land plays a really important role in climate, both in that our vegetation absorbs carbon dioxide, keeping it out of the atmosphere, or keeping some of it out of the atmosphere, and our land, the land surface reflects sunlight. And so the, the, the color of the land surface matters for how much sun is reflected back in, um, into space. And so by understanding this through, through satellites like Landsat, we can better understand the role of land and climate. I want to give a second example. What you'll see here is a satellite called Sentinel-6 Michael Freilich. This, is showing, this satellite measures total sea level. Um, and it is part of a series of satellites, so we actually have 30 years worth of observations of total sea level. And that can tell us sea level rise all around the world. And we can take that information and combine it with other observations, like GRACE and GRACE follow-on, which show us changes in the mass of ice sheets for the last 20 years, and understand not just how much sea level has risen, but also what are the contributors. How much is from melting of ice sheets? How much is from what's called thermal expansion, where when the water gets warmer, it takes more space? How much is from changes in the height of land, um, either land sinking or elevating? And we can put all those together and give information about what's changed and also why. In addition to observing the Earth, we also use models um, in, our, in our analysis. And we do this for a, a few different reasons. One is it can, can provide more complete information. So we can take the observations, combine them with our physical process understanding, and, add, uh, and get more information out. We can, secondly, we can use this to understand processes, so what is driving the change. And then last, we can use models to project into the future and understand what might happen um, going forward. And I'll come back to that last one later. But in terms of what this animation is, this is carbon dioxide um, in 2021. Um, and it's showing, it's using models. It's, it's got observations from a satellite called Orbital Carbon Observatory 2, which observes total carbon dioxide concentration. But this is trying to help you understand sources and sinks. So sources are things that lead to carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Sinks are things that absorb carbon on the land surface or in the ocean. The colors here are the, are the different sources. So what you see, that brown swirling, that's fossil fuel carbon dioxide. In some parts of this animation, you'll see a bluer color that's coming from the terrestrial, so land use, land cover. And then in parts of it, you'll see flashing of the southern hemisphere um, predominantly. That's absorption. So again, vegetation takes some of the emissions that we have out of the atmosphere and into land. Similarly, the oceans absorb some carbon. So this is trying to help us understand where is the carbon dioxide coming from and where does it go? How much goes into land, into ocean, or stays in the atmosphere? And the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, it traps heat. That's what um, a, a big driver of the warming we're experiencing is from greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide. And so understanding those, both how much we're emitting as well as where it's going, um, is really important for understanding climate. We can take this same information and estimate uh, carbon dioxide emissions. So this is a, an image of fossil fuel carbon dioxide emissions by country. Um, the height and the colors are indicating um, the, the level of emissions. Um, and what you could see, this is a static image just showing you average annual emissions um, between 2015 and 2020. If you were to look at this over time, what you would see is some countries have emissions arising, some countries actually have declines in emissions. But overall, we still have a lot of carbon dioxide emissions globally, which is what's driving climate, or one of the drivers of climate change. So I've been saying one of the drivers. So carbon dioxide is not the only greenhouse gas. Um, so historically, carbon dioxide has contributed about 0.8 degrees Celsius of warming out of the 1.1 degrees Celsius that we've experienced. Methane is also a contributor to warming, um, contributing about 0.5 degrees Celsius. So it's also a large, um, it's a greenhouse gas. It's per ton more potent. Um, so this animation is just showing sources um, of methane. And what you'll see is that methane has different sources. It's coming from different places because there's different processes that produce it. And so understanding those is really important for understanding what's happened till now, as well as what might happen in the future. 
So those are some of the drivers of climate change, and we can use observations and models to understand them. We also observe some of the effects of climate change. And this is um, looking at changes in land ice, or, or ice sheets, so Antarctica and Greenland. Um, and the animation is going to show you where, where we're losing ice, and in some cases where you might be gaining it, so the changes on a spatial scale. But overall, we've had declines in, in ice sheets in both Antarctica and Greenland. Um, and since these ice sheets are over land, as they melt and run into the ocean, they lead to um, they contribute to sea level rise. And so our sea levels are rising in part because of um, ice sheet melt. So that's just an overview. And we have a, a number of different satellites and instruments and model products that can help us understand what's happening on Earth. But I want to focus just on the International Space Station and give a, um, an um, a few examples of specific instruments on the International Space Station and how we use them to observe Earth. So the International Space Station, um, it orbits above and can observe about 90% of where Earth's population lives. So it's not covering the whole globe, but it's covering where most people live. Um, and it can see things like um, carbon di concentrations of carbon dioxide to three-dimensional structure of trees. And so I just want to give a few different examples of specific instruments um, that are currently, um, that are on the International Space Station. So the first one I want to talk about is EMIT. Um, and so this EMIT was installed on the International Space Station about a year ago. The mission's primary focus is mineral dust. So mineral dust are these fine particles that either reflect or absorb sunlight depending on their color. So lighter colored particles reflect sunlight. Just think about like snow reflecting sunlight when you're outside. Darker colored particles absorb sunlight. So like a dark pavement gets really hot on a sunny day. Um, we don't have a lot of observations before emit of mineral dust. And so we don't know on net, are we absorbing more or reflecting more? So on net, is mineral dust leading to warming or cooling of the planet? Again, we know that each particle, depending on its color, could have either effect. And so what emit is doing is doing a survey of mineral dust, understanding the sources of it, the color of it, so that we can better understand the role of mineral dust in climate. Um, and so this is um, um, just an image of Libya, and it's part of, of a square of Libya in the Saharan Desert, and it's looking, it's identified three three different types of minerals, and they would vary in their color um, based on things like their iron content or what, um, what they're being produced from. And so that's the primary mission of EMIT, is helping us understand mineral dust. And its primary focus areas are over dust-producing regions like the Sahara that you see here. But one of the things that the science team realized is that you can take that same instrument, and because of the way it works, you can also detect methane. So I mentioned that methane's a really uh, powerful greenhouse gas. So per ton, depending on the lifetime, it, it, can, um, it, it leads to either 20 or 80 times more warming than carbon dioxide, again, depending on the lifetime. So it's important to understand um, where methane is. This is a methane plume detected by EMIT, and this is in the southwest part, part of the US. Um, and so EMIT has detected hundreds of methane super emitters since its installation on the International Space Station. And some of these, um, these plumes are coming from leaky oil and gas pipes, and what they're leaking is also a product. So the people that own those actually want to know where is the methane. And so we can provide this information publicly so people understand what's happening and where we're seeing this. And so this is all available on the, um, the EMIT public-facing website. So that is a MIT. The second instrument I want to talk about is called JEDI. Um, so JEDI is a, a joint mission between NASA and the University of Maryland, um, and it's looking at the a 3D structure of, of trees. So it uses lasers, um, and it's understanding the height of trees and the canopy structure. So I mentioned Landsat can tell us where trees are. JEDI can tell us what they look like. And that's really important when we're trying to understand carbon. So if we want to know how much carbon is stored on land, we need to know not just where there are forests, but what do those forests look like. Bigger trees, taller trees mean more carbon than little trees. Um, and so trying to understand that. So this is just an animation of how JEDI was used um, to map out an old growth forest here in Washington state. Um, but that same technique has been used to, to map out a forest inventory for the continental U.S. Um, and this kind of thing can be um, used by the Department of Agriculture, the Forest Service, and the Bureau of Land Management to help us um, develop inventories of forests. Um, and they're particularly interested in these old growth or mature forests, both because they store a lot of carbon, but there's also a lot of vulnerability of trees to things like pests and wildfire that could help them, uh, that could end up with them losing some of that carbon. And with JEDI, we can understand both you know, what, what, how those trees look now and how they might change over time with different environmental changes and factors. So that is JEDI. 
The next one I want to mention is EcoStress. Um, so EcoStress, his primary mission is to measure the temperature of plants heating up as they run out of water. So it's trying to understand plant water stress. Essentially, when plants don't have enough water, they get hotter. So they essentially they have a fever. Um, and so EcoStress is designed to measure that by really precisely measuring temperature. But because it's measuring temperature, that means we can also look at urban heat islands um, and temperature of, of different parts of the world, we can look at phenomena like fires, heat waves, volcanoes. And so this particular image is uh, from EcoStress. It's in Las Vegas, um, and this is in June of 2022. Um, and in this city, what you're, what you're seeing is the temperature of, um, of the surface in Celsius. And the darkest um, reds are the hottest, and they are where there were dark colored streets. So you can actually see the street map by looking at the temperature. And those streets are measuring at more than 50 degrees Celsius or 122 degrees Fahrenheit on the surface. So they're very hot because they're dark colored. Um, there is another eco-stress um, image that's actually in California looking at the same type of thing, only in this particular town in California, they've painted a street in a lighter color, and you can actually see from eco-stress that it is cooler than the surrounding neighborhood um, because of the color of the street. And so we're able to look at that and look at things like urban heat islands. This is another eco-stress image. This is looking in Southern California. Um, and this, um, here we can look at um, dry vegetation and fire. So you can look at active fires from this because of the heat. And so we can use this tool that's looking for plant water stress and also use it to understand other uh, factors like heat. So those are three example instruments. I'd also like to mention one of the other things that we do on the International Space Station to help us with um, understand Earth is the crew photo. So astronauts on station take pictures of Earth with, the, um, with cameras they have on station as part of the Crew Earth Observations Project. And these can both help us see how pl um, the planet's changing over time. Um, it can also provide disaster relief um, so they can actually see some of these disasters. This particular image is of Hurricane Ian taken in September of 2022. Um, and this was taken above the Caribbean um, sea. As in, and at this point in time, Ian was just south of Cuba and headed towards Florida. Um, so this is from a crew photo on there. So part of what we're doing is helping understand how, what, the, what planet Earth looks like today, how it's changed over time, how climate is contributing to those changes. But if you're really thinking about planning into the future and what do I do, you also need to understand where might we go. So what does, what does it look like next year, or in 10 years, or in 50 years, and how can we use that for planning? And so we, um, in the science community, we use things like, called, we use models to help us understand that. And this particular in, uh, figure is from the most recent Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Report. And it's showing you global mean temperature rise. Prior to 2020, this is observ observed temperature. The blue colors are cooler, um, the red colors are warmer. When you get post 2020, what you see is there's five different possible paths for the future. And what's different across these five paths is the level of emissions in the future. Because how much future warming we experience depends on future emissions. The warming we've experienced to date is driven by human activity, um, in particular greenhouse gas emissions. So how much greenhouse gas emissions we have in the future will, um, will determine how much warmer it gets in the future. Um, and so this is just showing you five different possible futures here and what that would look like at different points in time. And this particular type of information is important for helping with planning. Um, so this can be provided to policymakers, decision makers, so they understand what might come and can think about what they should do in response. Uh, and it's not just, you know, large-scale policymakers, but also individual actors that use this. And one of the things we have to recognize at NASA is, is while we're researching climate change, we're also experiencing it. So we have several centers and facilities on low-lying and coastal regions along the East Coast, and they're vulnerable to sea level rise, storm surge, and flooding. We have centers out in California that are vulnerable to wildfire and drought. Um, and so we have a project that actually brings together the climate scientists at NASA with the facilities managers and takes projections like what I just showed on the previous slide and brings that to the facilities people to help them with their planning. Um, so we can better be prepared for the future because we need to ensure that we can continue to meet our mission in the face of climate change and ensure that we have continued access to space. Um, so we released a climate action plan in 2021 that's about that, so ensuring we have um, access to space and resilient infrastructure in the face of climate change. 
In addition to planning in the far future, we are also taking steps now to address um, some of the changes we are seeing. So this is actually an image of Kennedy Space Center, um, and some of the work they've done at Kennedy Space Center has included mangrove replanting and sand dune restoration. And this is to help protect our infrastructure and ecosystems so that we can continue to meet our mission. I want to touch briefly before I end on open science. So everything we do, we do in um, we do and make it publicly available. A big part of what we're doing is for the benefit of humanity, and that means providing that information to humanity. So this year is the year of open science, um, and so we are putting a, a specific effort across the agency on ensuring that our science is accessible, reproducible, and inclusive. So all the data that I talked about before from all of those missions is already publicly available, but what we're working on is making it easier to use. And some of that includes putting our tools and resources there. So it's not just the end product, the data, but also the, the, the codes and scripts we use to process it into usable products, um, that those are available. We're also working to put um, data into on the cloud in cloud compatible formats. Um, for scientists, we use different formats and different computers than the general public has access to, and we realize that's a barrier. And so can we move things into the cloud and make it easier to use? We're also working on trainings, including translating some of our trainings into Spanish language so that more people um, understand how to use the data and what we can learn from it. As part of this um, open science and um, understanding Earth effort, we have opened an Earth Information Center. Um, this is both a physical and a virtual space. The physical space is in Washington, D.C., in the NASA headquarters lobby. And the idea behind the physical space is really to engage the public, show people Earth as we see it, um, including showing you know, it, what you would see from space, um, immersing people in data, and helping them understand what we understand about our planet, what kind of information we have to help them um, understand what's happening in their communities and plan for the future. Because that people are making decisions every day that are influenced by climate, from a homeowner or a home buyer assessing flood risk to a farmer deciding what crops to grow or when to water them. And so we want to make sure that people understand what we know about the planet and have access to that information. Um, and we are including information beyond just NASA, so some of our other federal government partners, like NOAA, which does weather. Um, they do, they do observations, they also do weather forecasts and hurricane predictions, so bringing that data in as well. And so in the physical space, it's really about engaging and informing, but then we recognize not everyone can come to D.C., and if you're making a decision that's, you know, maybe it's easier from your home. Um, so there is a virtual platform, um, go.nasa.gov slash EIC, um, where you can get um, access to this, and this is just the first phase, and we're building it out, and we're really trying to learn from people as they're interacting with the data, um, what do they need and how can we make it easier to use. And so I will just close now with just a picture of the moon um, from the International Space Station. And, you know, as we're exploring the universe, we are always looking back and thinking about Earth um, and making sure that everything we do is for the benefit of humanity. And with that, I will take any questions. Thank you, Dr. Calvin. Very impactful keynote. Our first question is, we hear we're approaching the tipping point. What do you believe is the most accurate tipping point measure and how close to it are we? Yeah, thank you for that question. So I think tipping point has a very precise meaning in science that's often not the way it's um, used in the general public. So in science, we're talking about a, a point at which the, the system restructures. Um, and I think often when people are talking about tipping points in the real world, they mean, are we crossing some threshold where things are different? And what I would say is, you know, the last nine years are the warmest since record keeping began. What we know from science is that warming will continue as long as carbon dioxide emissions are positive, which they are, so we should expect more warming in the future. But how much more warming depends on actions taken between now and um, actions between, taken between now and that future date. And with all the, with the warming we're experiencing and any potential future warming, we will see more impacts. And depending on where you live, you're experiencing different impacts that might be more um, that you, that, than others. So again, we see more wildfire and drought on the west coast of the U.S., more flooding, coastal effects on the east coast. Um, so each community is facing a different impact. Our next question is, how can we help break down these facts to people who may not be familiar or have a science-specific background? Or in other words, can this information be found somewhere else in layman's terms? 
Yeah, and that's a big effort we have at NASA is trying to figure out how to communicate this to people with very diverse backgrounds, different ages, different scientific skill sets. And I think one thing just to recognize is that we are all coming from a different place and we all process information in different ways. And so some of what we've been doing at NASA, we have a website, um, climate.nasa.gov, where we include a lot of information both on what the state of the planet now, but also frequently asked questions. We use social media. We're using um, things like talks like these or you know traditional press. Um, to get the information out and trying to think about how to explain it and relate to people where they are. And I see we just gotten a two minute warning, so maybe one last question. Yep, this will be our last one. So many of us probably feel that climate change might feel like an overwhelming problem. So what can we do as individuals and as a community to help our planet? Yeah, so I think one thing just to know is we, we know what's driving climate change, and that actually gives us a lot of information um, about what might happen in the future. There are a lot of options available today that influence um, em emissions and, and that have an impact on the future. And then just, you know, we also, you, there's ways you can contribute to science. So we have an active citizen science program. So if you want to contribute to the science we're doing, we have a number of things you can do just with the app on your phone where you can help us better understand our planet and contribute in that way. So there's a, an app called Globe that can help you observe clouds. Um, there is a game called NemoNet where it helps us understand coral reefs and categorize coral reefs. And there's a whole host of other citizen science efforts on our webpage where you can help contribute to our science, help us understand our planet.